Join me in prayer. Holy God, by your Holy Spirit, bring these ancient words to life, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may know how you want us to spend our days and become ever clearer reflections of your love. Amen. Listen now to a reading from the Gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter, verses 3 through 9. While he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show them kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body for burial be beforehand. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. She enters the room without a sound. As she approaches Jesus, the dinner conversation goes quiet. Into the silence comes the sharp crack of a clay jar being broken, and Jesus finds himself blinking oil out of his eyes. The smell of nard fills the room, spiky and earthy at once, like new green shoots growing from the ground. A moment more and the outcry will begin, the angry complaints and shouts of disgust. But for now, the woman has done what she came to do. She won't need to explain herself. Without saying a word, she has proclaimed the whole gospel. You're probably familiar with this story in one version or another. It appears in all four of our Gospels, although at different times in Jesus' life. Mark, whom we read today, places it during the events of Holy Week, two days before the Last Supper. He does not give the woman a name or a voice. She never speaks a word. Perhaps that is why this story never made much of an impact on me. You see, I am a word girl. I love words. I always have. I actually enjoyed vocabulary tests as a kid. I get goosebumps over Shakespeare's iambic pentameter. I geek out over Greek and Latin and Hebrew. I spend hours laboring over papers and blog posts, sermons, even texts and emails, trying to get my words just right. I deeply value people who always manage to say the right thing. To me, words are as elemental as fire, water, and earth. They construct worlds. Perhaps that's why I was a bit miffed to discover that my college class's motto was factum non verbum, Latin for actions, not words. It felt rude to me somehow, dismissing the power of words. Yet I have always known what is, to me, the sad truth that words have their limits. There are some things they just cannot do. A thousand beautifully worded bereavement cards are not the same as a hug. A million carelessly tossed out I love yous don't mean much without loving actions to back them up. 
I'm reminded of the wisdom of James, who wrote to the early Christians that it was no good to tell someone, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, if you don't supply their bodily needs as well. Words that do not spring from actions or produce actions are just clanging cymbals and noisy gongs to use another biblical image. For some things, words just aren't enough. Perhaps this is why the woman who anoints Jesus bypasses them altogether. After all, Jesus had been telling his disciples that he must die for a long time, and they still don't seem to understand. His words have fallen on deaf ears. So the woman tries a different tack. She prophesies the death of Jesus, not with more words, but through one single action. The woman who anointed Jesus with oil has not often been thought of as a prophet, but she has every claim to that lineage. It is true that prophets are scarce on the ground in the New Testament. There isn't much need for them with Jesus around, but there is John the Baptist proclaiming the coming of Christ and this unnamed woman proclaiming his death. The tradition of prophets, men and women who act as God's mouthpieces on earth, is richer in the Old Testament with familiar names like Isaiah and Miriam and Jeremiah. In fact, many of the books in our Old Testament are simply records of their prophecies, the words they felt charged by God to share with God's people. The point of such prophecies is to say something known only by God, either because it hasn't happened yet or because humanity is too blind to see it going on around them. Not all prophecies were shared in words, however. There is a theme in the Old Testament of prophets using actions to convey what God was about to do. These actions often seemed crazy to the outside observer. For example, the prophet Jeremiah wore an ox's yoke on his shoulders to symbolize the time God's people would spend under the authority of Babylon. The prophet Ezekiel ate a scroll filled with God's words in order to literally have the word of God in his mouth. Later, he shaved off his beard and burned it in order to prophesy the fiery destruction of the city. Now, compared to those Old Testament prophets, the woman who anoints Jesus with oil appears rather tame. Yet she, too, relays a message with her action, a message that comes in three parts. In the crack of the jar, in the ooze of the oil, listen to what she is saying. This one is king. This one is about to die. This one's death will release something precious into the world. Those of you who know this story better from the Gospel of jo John may remember that the woman anoints Jesus' feet and washes them with her hair. But in Mark, she anoints Jesus' head with oil just as Samuel anointed David's head in order to declare him king. In fact, it was always the prerogative of prophets to anoint the kings of Israel. While the other dinner guests are patting themselves on the back for securing an invitation with Jesus the great teacher, Jesus the great healer, this woman understands who he truly is, God's anointed king, one with the God who created and rules over all. Yet she does more than just declare Jesus is king. She also, as Jesus himself explains to the dim-witted guests, anoints his body for burial. 
This act of anointing the dead was a last act of care for a person, usually committed by women, like the women who will go to Jesus' tomb on the third day with their oils and spices. While everyone else around Jesus is either refusing to understand what is about to happen or actively plotting his death, this woman gets it. She does not wait for his death to show him kindness, but comes immediately as if to say, I understand what's about to happen. You are not alone in this. But the woman says yet a third thing, something more complicated and more visionary than either the acknowledgement that Jesus is king or that he is about to die. These things, at least, Jesus himself has already said. Listen again to what the woman does. She carries in the jar of nard, breaks it open, and pours out every single last, expensive, precious drop. Nothing is kept back. Nothing saved for later. And from this broken vessel, from this loss, this waste, as the other guests put it, the fragrance of nard fills the room perfuming not just the head of Christ, but the air everyone breathes. The woman knows that Jesus will die, but more than that, she knows that Jesus' death will not go to waste. Something beautiful will be released through Christ's death, something that will cover us all with the scent of God's grace. Salvation will flow from the broken body of Christ like nard from the clay jar. It will cover the whole world, even those who rage and splutter and claim they know a better way. Like the woman with her jar, Christ will hold nothing back. No escape plan, no enemy unloved, no sin unforgiven and in giving his life for us, will invite us into new life. We too are broken people. Sometimes literally with arthritis and heart murmurs and depression. Sometimes with grief, with dreams unreached, with memories of failure. Sometimes we have been broken by abuse, by injustice, by circumstances far beyond our control. Sometimes we can't even pinpoint why, but somewhere deep inside we know all is not right. Somewhere between our entrance as God's good children into God's good world and where we sit in the pew today, something went wrong. Some load was too hard to handle. Some person we loved left us. Some promise we made we never did fulfill. Something broke. But hear the good news. In the breaking of the jar, rich fragrance flows. In the breaking of Christ's body on the cross, salvation comes into the world. And through the cracks of our brokenness, God is pouring something beautiful into our lives. Understanding, compassion, service, humility, insight, healing, hope. Our brokenness does not put us out of commission as followers of Christ. It is instead an invitation to follow Christ in giving our all. Just as Christ gave everything, life, compassion, friendship, healing, wisdom, hospitality, love, so that we might have a glimpse of what the kingdom of God looks like, let us give whatever we have Whatever gifts, 
whatever time, whatever words and actions, that others might catch that same vision. In other words, friends, even in our brokenness, let us be prophets. First in actions and in words, let us proclaim who we believe Christ to be, the one who died so that others might have life, the one who loved sinners so that we might know love, the one who proved once and for all that joy, not pain, will have the final say. So this week, take a cue from this prophet woman Break out your jars of nard, your grandmother's recipes, your checkbooks. Come to the dinner party without your invitation, without waiting to be asked, without needing anyone else's approval. Spill out what is precious to you upon someone else's head, your gifts, your time, your energy, your love. Even if the word Jesus never crosses your lips this week, let it be heard in the working of your hands, your feet, your heart. Let the name of Jesus be proclaimed in the dinner you make your family, in the attention you pay to the welfare of your company, in the care you give to your students, patients, friends, in the choices you make as you drive down the interstate, in your efforts to recycle, in the time you take for your own sanity, in each action of service and compassion. Here is the good news of the gospel. Christ did not come to lift a pristine people out of this world and into glory. Christ unleashed his grace so that the healing could begin now, while we are still hurting, that love could flourish now while we are still so suspicious, that new life could begin now, even now, while death is all around us. So serve as you are, give as you are, love as you are. Pour out all the precious gifts that you have locked inside you. In Christ, through Christ, with Christ, it will be enough. Amen.